How was lunch? Was it good? All right. I didn't get anything. I had, to, I had a presentation coming up. Um, I can see, did any one of you see uh, Sachi from Airbus? The deep learning. That was awesome. And apparently, I cannot compete with that. Uh, a little bit fewer people um, in this session. But nonetheless, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, the next half an hour, I'm, I'm basically going to take you through um, what, what has been our journey in, in Novo Nordisk in terms of, of really creating a, uh, what I call in this presentation uh, an analytics-powered organization. Um, it's divided into two parts, um, and uh, I'll dive a little bit into that. I think um, just to set the expectations, I'd like to know just you know, who you are, um, so I kind of can you know, uh, align the presentation as we go along. How many of you are data scientists? Native data scientists, all right. How many of you data scientists are leaders? How many leaders do I have here, managers? How many are in big corporations? Let's start with 1,000. 5,000? 10,000? 50,000? OK. Cool. I, uh, I come from this. If you don't know anyone who has diabetes, you don't know about No Nordic, which is very good. Uh, but in reality, uh, we are a global company. We are 45,000 people spread across the world. Um, we are very much leading uh, in terms of delivering life-saving treatments to diabetes patients. This will be my very brief introduction to Novo Nordisk. The rest of the presentation will be an uh, about analytics, data science, and machine learning, and so forth. Um, we have, and I'm sitting in production, and it's interesting to know who you are. I'm sitting in a small part of Novo Nordisk, but actually it's 15,000 people manufacturing diabetes products. So just to set a little bit about the expectation, how big a company this is. Um, we, um, we are also um, you know, in a space which is just notoriously difficult to work in. So there's a lot of constraints, especially around how is it that you're manufacturing, how is you supply, how is it you run your uh, clinical trials and so forth. So just to say that this is a little bit of a difficult game than many, maybe many of you others um, I experience. Um, but that is just more setting the scene in terms of, of who Novo Nordisk is. And then, yeah, you can see 25, 29 million patients we're delivering to in, in almost all countries in the entire world. Um, I am personally um, sitting in supply chain and manufacturing, um, heading up a small unit, uh, working on advanced analytics, trying to push the boundaries. This is my Steve Jobs picture. I'm trying to make a little bit of a funny presentation here. Um, it, I, I didn't really even consider it when I took the picture, but you know, I had this hoihals, I don't know what it's called in, in, in Danish, but you, you know, I, this is also, you could say, my Swedish picture. Yeah. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, I didn't even know it, but um, our good friend from HMI, uh, I actually already connected, we just realized it. Um, but uh, we didn't realize it before, we actually met each other. Um, so, so that is the funny part of, of you know, utilizing these. So feel free just to reach out afterwards if you want the slides or some, some deeper information that I did touch upon. Um, I like architecture, I like deep tech, I like running, I like books, uh, and all these things. Um, and then just a, a small thing here, you know, you could do two presentations, you do a lot of bragging, um, this is one of them, uh, but actually the second part of presentation is also to just give you a realistic picture of what it is to do what we do and what we are passionate about. Um, and I'll do the second part. So the bragging stops here. Um, we were voted the, the number one supply chain last year in, uh, in pharma. Um, but uh, enough about that. Um, the presentation is divided into two parts. The first part is very much the journey um, about what we've been doing in terms of scaling analytics. Um, I know you all come here to hear a lot about data science, machine learning, deep learning, all the cool, new, new cool stuff. But reality is just in big companies like ours, the majority of our time is analytics. It's about creating descriptive analytics, it's diagnostics, it is simple taking and pulling data out and showing some insights to some decision makers that then basically are the ones responsible for delivering these recommendations or changes where some of the more, uh, you could say, advanced parts is still uh, very much kept in small pockets that I keep to the second part. 
So the first part is very much just sharing a little bit about our journey and, and how we have basically gone from the small pilots and tested and scaled it almost across Novo Nordisk. That is partly true. We, we are still scaling quite significantly. So, um, the story with the, the Michael J. Fox picture is that uh, in 2014, two things happened. I don't know if you know the first thing, but basically it was an anniversary of the Back to the Future um, movie. And then, um, I think it was a Japanese company, I'm not quite sure, Hendo, they actually created a hoverboard. I don't know, did you see that? Uh, no, but, yeah, no, but they actually created it together with Tony Hawk. It was, you know, got a lot of commercial. Um, uh, and, and basically, the interesting part here is that how you can basically build, using uh, magnetic forces, a real hoverboard. I don't know how much commercial they went with it. And maybe that is basically the example here is that one thing is you're technology driven. The other thing is basically, maybe not always, it does make a lot of sense to, to create a hoverboard. And nonetheless, we set the same ambition. I can see there's a mouse flickering here. Um, and they, it was basically to create our own hoverboard. Uh, and I know, I know this sounds uh, pretty simple in a context that, that we only came up with four things I think many of you maybe have already done. Uh, it is taking some data, shove it into a central data repository. Uh, the second thing is basically just empowering people to do what they like with the right tools. Uh, third thing is very much, you know, driving some sort of community uh, that really cultivates four things, data processes, people, and technology. And then finally, uh, in, in all big corporations, uh, you need some sort of governance, especially when you are so heavily regulated. Um, so that was the four things. Uh, I'll take you through uh, each of them one by one, um, just to, to explain you what we basically did in, in this journey, these four things that were the components of our little hoverboard. Uh, but before we do that, um, now I need to kind of uh, remember my presentation was basically two challenges that, uh, that we were trying to address here. One of the biggest challenges that we saw was that we were spending, and I'm not kidding, requiring and pulling out data from our big systems. It took us, the rule of thumb is it took us a year and it cost a million Danish kroner. If you are a manager or you're a data scientist, then you know by nature that the managers and especially the business sides uh, are usually very impatient. So one year was basically unacceptable, but that was basically the world we live in, and that was very much the first challenge uh, that we saw. Um, heavily um, um, because of, of our, or at that time, uh, and also now, our big ERP system, SAP, just to be... Uh, fully transparent, that this is one of the things that is interesting is that in general, many of you do have a lot of legacy systems. Not that SAP is a legacy system, but basically you just have these systems where it's, they're not built for sharing data uh, as we would like, especially when you are uh, data-driven or data scientist, you just, you, know, you just want your data. Uh, so that's the first challenge. Um, then the second challenge uh, was basically that not only did we have um, you know, the bottleneck, but actually we had thousands of bottlenecks across all the different systems. So this was kind of the, the representative of, of all these uh, different uh, systems, that all of them were difficult to pull out data. So what, what, what we basically decided here, mentioned in the previous slide or the slide before, was how do we deal with this? And, and now I'm kind of forgetting to mention that not only it was difficult to pull out the data, there was also just inherent a low trust of the data that's getting out there. So what we basically did was just simplified very much here take some raw data, put it into a database, let everyone who wanted to access the, this data access it. So basically we have today 3,000 3, users that actually can access this data without any government. And I'm not kidding, anyone can see all this data if they want to. They just need to go through some very simple training steps, read some SOPs, standard operating procedures, we love those in, in Pharma. Um, and then they can access all the data. They can access all the raw data. They can access the data building blocks or the big entities we have. And they can also access the presentations uh, of the data. And I think this has been um, a, a shift that, that, that is very much related to the, the, the hoverboard. It is simply unimaginable at, at that given time that we were able to shift from having very, very rigid 
very closed down bottlenecks where you can only access the data that you had you know, somehow requested, to actually going to a stage today where more than 3,000 people can access all this data. What you also need to know is that we have, we have actually just chosen some very simple technologies because there was a lot of people available to do this. So we had some very skilled SQL programmers that basically from day one could take and transform our transactional data into these building blocks needed. What we also did was making these self-service tools widely available. So we had, of course, all these very highly skilled people, but we had a scarcity of them. So what do you do basically with a scarcity? You try to figure out if there's any technology, or at least that is what we did at that time, that could solve this issue. Uh, and these tools, I'll allude to them in, in a second, is basically very code-free tools. Uh, there's one out here which um, argues they can do uh, everything uh, that the data scientist does. Uh, without any coding um, <coughs> data robot. Um, let's see if that is the true uh, or the true case. Um, what, what is remarkable here is that basically some of the stories that we hear is that people from line of business has suddenly um, has suddenly had people uh, where previously they're very dependent on IT people or very skilled programmers, where where they now today have business analysts, data analysts, that basically are the small powerhouses out in line of business. They can easily pull out all the data from a SQL database, if it is there, it has to be there. Uh, we still need to kind of do some interfaces with all these many thousand systems. But if they are there, then basically the business analysts suddenly become the most valuable persons in these departments, because you have basically pushed the empowerment all the way to the first line of decision making. And this is, this is a very important point, and I think this is also a very important point for what we want to do later on in terms of advanced analytics. You need to basically be where the decisions are being made, and the closer you can move the empowerment, the better. At least that is, that is our case, or our belief. Uh, secondly, um, something that, that, that really also is remarkable, with this setup and the tools we have chosen, then many of the, the departments which has been super operational, they spent, you know, I don't know how many hours on reporting and pulling out data and building models in, in, in big VBL uh, SQLs and, and also different scripts. They have suddenly gone from 80% operational to 20%. Uh, and this shift has really allowed a lot of these people to develop tons of new insights, which we haven't seen. So this combination of not only moving stuff, to a line of business, but actually also making it a lot more productive with these tools and, and this setup is, is where we have seen that the power is really being generated. That was in 16. Let's move a little bit forward. Um, and, and today, the setup as we have built is, is actually pretty simple. Let me take them you know, step by step. It is from the bottom up, basically we have uh, Altrix, which is a super, super easy drag and drop. Tool. It also has some, some, some heavier data science elements. Uh, with, I, would, I would say we have not been that successful with, with the data science in Altrix, but nonetheless, the entire data prep um, is, is super powerful. Um, and we have some designers, we have some controllers, we have three servers, which is sitting in AWS, which basically just takes all these workflows and transform the data on a daily basis into whoever needs this data, uh, of course, mainly the decision makers. Um, the workflows are saved in our file share, uh, which everyone is, is allowed to, to look in uh, and also change. Um, if, we, if we go and ask our colleagues in IT, and I'm on the business side, they call it the Wild West. Uh, I think we, we call it some, somehow the control cares. Um, it does require some governance, which I'll allude to next slide. Uh, but basically, this is, this is our setup. Uh, one powerful thing which I haven't mentioned here is, is a lot of the workflows in the data, both from the SQL and Altrix that we use mainly, uh, but also some of the scripts. Actually, we collect all this metadata, um, and we use, um, use that basically to populate it into some sort of data catalog. There are a few lessons learned here is that you need to treat the different use cases or you could say the decisions you want on, on different levels, especially also when you look at the data. So some of the data we have realized we need to certify. So when it becomes so important, you need to certify it and then you need to make sure that it has some minimum requirements in terms of how, how do you actually document this. Um, but still, it is very much where we 
have basically the last couple of years let go. Uh, we had the ambition of building some sort of hoverboard, and this is basically where we are. Um, I haven't mentioned the front ends. There's many different front ends, but we are using mainly Tableau. Um, then uh, another thing, which 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 is not only you know the data, the technology uh, that really has has elevated um, what we're doing is how we have built some sort of culture around. We we. We, we take on new employees, we upskill current employees, um, not so much focused on management, which I'll come to in, in the second part, but basically, you know, everything from, we have Tableau Thursdays, where people can come and ask silly questions, super advanced, uh, you know, uh, super basic, but anything that, that really is, is, is needed um, in, in order for people to get going, uh, because many of them are sitting pretty alone in line of business. Um, and, and here, you know, it, it's my data analyst, but it's also a data scientist that basically meets up every Thursday, four hours, and answer whatever questions. And what is really cool about this is you can use it in many aspects. And, and, and the next thing is that you can use these information to feed it up to what we call an advisory board. So we don't have a board which is governing this and, you know, deciding on the technology, but basically they're sitting a bunch of people, including myself, where we take in all the things from Tableau Thursdays to the projects we're running, the different use cases, and then basically trying to figure out what is the state of this ecosystem we have built, and then making sure that we, you know, constantly evaluate, do we have enough server capacity, do we train our people enough, uh, you know, have we the budget that support this and all these things. And what, what I didn't mention was that all of this has been driven out of line of business. And I didn't ask if any of you were from IT, so maybe that is my question now to you. Any of you from IT? So the risk is from line of business or small startup or consultants, I assume. Uh, but basically, what we realized, or what we, we, the reason, one of the reasons why we did this in the beginning um, and, and wanted to build the hoverboard was basically the things that we had available, no offense, from IT at that given time, a lot has happened since, didn't meet the requirements. But they were so rigid at that given time that you know, they could solve everything. You, know, you just need to go and ask IT. Um, and, um, and then they would come with the tool and the technology and data and everything would be fine in one year and cost a million. What is interesting now, there's a few lessons to learn, but basically I, I wanted to put in a slide, is that we have now, after four years, moved everything to IT. So what is really interesting here is that Line of Business has created this entire technology journey with thousands of people tapping into data. We have more than 250 people sitting and, and making literally on a daily basis, Altrix flows that are transforming data. And it's, it's done by a line of business. The lessons learned, however, and I think I didn't mention this, is that the, maybe the first one is that if I could have done this differently, I wanted IT on board from day one, if they wanted to. Uh, they didn't want to in the beginning. Uh, I, think, I think they would think, I, I think personally, I hope they will think twice next time. But let's see. Um, but, but nonetheless, uh, the lessons we have learned are four things. Uh, you, you need to have some smart governance around your, your raw data. You know? So that's everything from semantic, uh, naming conventions, and so forth. That is, that is very, very much the key. Um, and it's very much also the key in terms of the next step. Um, you know, uh, at least that is, that is my belief. You know, the, the level of hygiene in your data needs to uh, you know, go rapidly up or significantly up uh, the further and the more advanced you get here we still have the possibility, because it's provided to the decision maker, that uh, he or she can basically decide if the data makes sense or not. Uh, when we go to an algorithm uh, world where everything is done in a, model, in a model, then it requires something differently of data. Uh, then the data lag, and that's kind of like the second point I'm alluding to here. Um, then, then again, uh, it is very much this idea about cultivating uh, data and analytics and processes and people. You know, don't put all your money on the technology in itself. Uh, you need to have something around it. So that's very much where empowerment comes in. And then finally, but not least, uh, it's, it's easy to look in hindsight, but basically, you know, start measuring your value from day one. That was the first part. Write down some questions, Mark. Now, uh, questions for that part if, if you feel it's needed. Now, let's go to the second part. So basically, where we are today. So we went from past, now we are present, and now we'll talk a little bit about that and then the future in the end. It is that, to be honest, 
many, many, many big companies, and I see them today. Sergi, the Airbus presentation that was, you know, I'm alluding to it, it was widely impressive. But he also mentioned in the end, I don't know if you noticed this, that they're working on the next step, which is making the models production ready. How do you scale this? That was at least how I got out of uh, one of the small bullets in the end. He didn't allude a lot to it uh, because it was very impressive, but in, in reality, many of us are actually struggling with taking these proof of concept and then scaling them. So that is very much the cow represented in the picture. You know, we're kind of in the middle, many of us, but how do you kind of move, move from there? Briefly, um, advanced analytics for me is very much that, that it's, it's autonomous. It is basically where you're using more sophisticated techniques than what I showed you in the previous slide. Not to neglect it, but basically that is, that is where we want to head. And it is very much you know, to discover deeper, deeper insight, make prediction, and, and generate recommendations. That is at least Gardner's take. I very much buy into it. My best example or reference to this is the self-driving car. I think many of you are also using this potentially in presentations, now I'm just doing it again. Um, and, um, and basically, if, if we look at what analytics is for me, then it's my Porsche. I don't have one. I have a small Audi. I cannot afford anything more than that. My boss, he just got the Model 3, and he, you know, he, he, he runs around and brags about it. It's really nice and can do all these fancy things. For me, that is very much the space of advanced analytics, where you are taking all the sensors and signals and processes, and, and you make some sort of decision or recommendation in a very given environment. So to, to some extent, it is a, a simple way on, of interpreting um, a situation with data. We haven't even come close, at least in our uh, area, to what they are really trying to do with autonomous vehicles. But there's a very, very, um, uh, you could say, uh, closely interlinked connection between autonomous and AI. Uh, and it will be very interesting to see how fast it will go. I think Elon Musk he had some sort of prediction that his entire uh, Model 3 would be like an autonomous vehicle that was just floating around here in 2021 uh, or something like that, but he's not very good at predicting. Uh, I think it will be more or less the same with many of the things we, we, are, we are embarking on now. It will be a lot more difficult than what we say uh, it is. And three examples of this difficulty is very much summarized in a lately very good report um, in Howard Business Review, the middle one. Um, and, and the inter interesting thing here and the reference to the first part of the presentation is very much that it's not so much about the technology. Uh, I'm not fully agreeing on that. It's not so much about the data. Uh, well, it, we kind of need it. But I do agree that is somehow being spent too much time talking about these two aspects and too little about the culture, especially in big companies like ours. Because that is really where you need to put your money um, in order to successfully scale this. There's many other reference points. Uh, I think I like Gartner very much. There's a lot of hype around it. Uh, that's, I think, the reason why we're all here today, to learn a lot about data science and machine learning. Um, but there's also uh, somehow, um, um, you could say, not, not a conflict, but basically uh, uh, something counterintuitive. It is that 50% of all the things that we are setting sail or the data science projects we're trying to, uh, to um, um, you could say, uh, run, only 50% of them actually are a success, which I think is very interesting. Why, why is it that only 50% of these data science projects actually doesn't become more than just a good idea or proof of concept? And then finally, but not least, when we really you know, are trying to push the boundaries in terms of AI, then it's just kept in the corner, or at least that is their prediction. Um, so how is it that we address these, this, this overall problem in terms of actually successfully scaling AI and machine learning and advanced analytics across organizations? I think there are seven decisions that need to be made. Um, so this is my take on it. Um, and um, it is very much about priority, it's focus, it's allocations, it is education, how you organize yourself, and then data and technology, obviously. My best take is that in order to become AA-driven fully, you really need to focus your investments. You need to spend your time clever. You need to utilize your talent in a way that uh, I'm not quite sure that we are doing uh, to the extent that we should. Maybe some of you are. Uh, I'd like us to do it differently. Um, 
This is my best guess of if I were to make a decision between two different axes, then it would look something like this. I'll take you through each of them very quickly. I think I'm running out of time. Ish. First thing, and what we've done, is that basically, uh, in order to really create some commitment in organizations like ours, we started out with a big, big project. We had many small use cases, but to be honest, they didn't really fly. Uh, they came from bottom up. They had some good intentions. Some of them are super interesting, uh, and I'm, I think they will very much change how we do it. So we're using, for instance, deep learning on our inspection lines, where we look at 600 images per minute to figure out if there's any false positives. So we're basically rejecting good products uh, on a net computer. So that is one example, I think, will. But basically, if you really want to embrace this journey, you need to start big. And we started with a digital transformation project on one of our production sites in Hillerød. This one is a very small picture. I'm not, I wasn't quite sure if I was allowed to present the, the full picture of, of what we're doing. So um, this is a tiny version, um, and maybe the easiest way uh, for me then to tell you what we did. Um, but basically what we did was we sat down, we did a digital scan for eight weeks, figured out what were the top 10 most relevant technologies that we could, or use cases where we could apply technology to solve something. So very much driven by the use cases uh, instead of the technologies, and very much driven by value. And that is my second point. Um, and this really kick-started our journey in advanced analytics, but not, not only that, but also in general what is you, you can do when you really apply different technologies um, in, in a, you could say, in a controlled environment. The second thing is that um, I've seen it many times, um, and, and I'm very passionate about technology. I even went to a deep tech boot camp at MIT earlier this summer. Um, so I'm all in, but I'm also from the business side, and I just need to realize that even though this sounds like a very good idea, having a small robot you know, that can fly around like a drone, it's still difficult for me sometimes to see the value that are being generated by this example. So therefore, for me, it is very key that whatever you have uh, of opportunity, you need to start with some sort of value. You need to, you need to start where the pain point is, or at least that is, that is my take. Um, then the third thing is that once you do have some sort of use case or value proposition or pain point that, that, is, that, that needs to be addressed, then I can see a room full of super clever people, and the things that you do are just simply amazing. But I'm also a little bit concerned that sometimes you get time to do something in the corner, and it doesn't really turn out, or at least 50% of the time is what Gartner says. So if I were someone uh, managing, I would allow for experimenting, but I would also very much try to really help teams go out, do very small, agile, Project two to three months, set a small team. I'm leading some of them these days with an engineer, uh, a data scientist, and then someone who knows the business. And I think this is where really uh, some of the magic comes out. And it, 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 it has just proven to work for us, at least. Um, then um, something uh, that we're also spending a lot of our resources on these days is educating everyone. We did it in the Digital Transformation Project, and this is just one example where we went through you know, awareness of advanced analytics, what are the different concepts. Uh, but actually, we've taken it even further now that we do full day where we basically take managers through everything from regressions to uh, decision trees to deep learning. And, and we're not just showing them the different use cases, but basically taking them through the different math that lies behind it. So, so this is one way to address at least one of the gaps that I see in terms of of, of succeeding with advanced analytics, and that's very much educating management. And then secondly, establishing some sort of communities of best practice. I have two more things I think I will say. Then many of you in bigger organizations may wonder how to organize yourself. I don't think there's a good answer to this. We talked about uh, digital transformation projects or flagships that really gets a lot of attention. Uh, reality is I'm not sitting in one of those. Um, so I can, we have a big digital accelerator program in Novo Nordisk, 75 people that are doing like, you know, all the cool stuff. They have unicorns in the corners and the MacBooks and all these things. It's 75 people out of 45,000 people. Not everyone can work there. So what do we do with the West? Um, and, and what we're doing here, and this is, I had to admit, it's on camera, I've stolen it. It is from the Harvard Business Review. But this is very much what I think is actually what we're trying to do. We have these small units of, uh, of businesses. They call them spoke. 
Um, and and, and they, those are the ones that are actually driving you, the different use cases. And then what we recently are doing is building a center of excellence. Um, but there's not really um, a, a rule for how to do this. Then the final thing, and since we don't have time, um, I just need to say that even though culture, at least in my opinion, from my side, is super important, Whatever we want to do here, you cannot really do it without your data. Um, that is your source of your energy, and the technology is basically the wings, right? Um, my young um, uh, data scientist gave me this picture. I don't know really if it fits, uh, but, but nonetheless, um, I tried it out, and then the, you know, the culture is how we consume it. That was me. Thank you.